All right, thanks for joining me, everyone. Charles Moskowitz here. And um, my guest is Jason Jones, who uh, is, uh, well, you know, I just lost, oh, here it is, thank you. Um, president of the Human Rights Education and Relief Organization, H-E-R-O. Um, he is also the author of the new book, The Great Campaign Against the Great Reset. Jason, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me on your show, Charles. All right. So I, I, I'd like to focus on your book, The Great Reset, because this is something that is starting to percolate out there more frequently now as people become aware of what this means and what this is. I think it especially uh, became uh, part of the public consciousness around the time of the, uh, the so-called uh, pandemic. So... Could you please uh, give us a brief thumbnail, if you will, of what the Great Reset is? Yeah, I think that we all started hearing this term. Um, we'd see little clips on social media from Klaus Schwab, who mm -hmm. looks like he was literally walking off the set of a Bond movie. You see him and you're like, hey, am, I, am I at Universal Studios? Are they shooting a movie around here? I don't know what's going on. I and know, then he really. says things that... Uh, would come from a dime store novel in the 50s about some evil villain. Like, you're going to own no property and be happy. You you will be eating cricket meat and like it. And if you, if all of his kind of pronouncements or the world economic yes. foreign pronouncements. So you can like, eat the bugs. Right? It's like you. You. It's not like <laughs> us. It's not like we yeah. will. We will have no, no. You will be eating cricket meat. So, um, but what my book really does is it looks at the ideological instruments and rhetoric that are going to be used to dispossess us of everything that we hold sacred and dear. And the Great Reset is really sort of this culmination of nihilism, totalitarianism, and despair that the West has sunk to. Mm -hmm. And so there have been a lot of very good books at the Great Reset. Uh, about the Great Reset, and my book is specifically an anthropological look. Um, what is the nature and purpose of the human person? And how does the Great Reset seek to change a man and his relationship to his uh, man, man and his relationship to man, and man and his relationship to God? Yes, indeed. And uh, I think that it's safe to say that the present manifestation of the Great Reset, which of course goes back in history, uh, was launched when Klaus Schwab published his book predicting the pandemic a couple of months before the actual pandemic was declared. But uh, it goes way back. I mean, it goes back into, I would argue, Mystery Babylon. It goes back to secret societies. It's a big, big subject. It's uh, what uh, former uh, Soviet spy Whitaker Chambers in his great book, Witness, called The Choice Between God and Man and the world's second oldest religion, which is worship by uh, of, of man. I mean, of, of an elite group of people who basically surpass God and who present themselves as some kind of an enlightened, uh, super strong being that have a right to rule the world. And, uh, you know, it's anathema, of course, to uh, the first religion, which is that man is created, men and women, it's, it actually says in the book of Genesis, are created in the image of God. And thus we all have sovereignty under God, the great sovereign, not the state, not this elite that seeks to control us. Um, their ideas, as you, you say, Jason, really run opposite to the American ideal, don't they? Yeah, so Charles, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you went deep there with these Babylonian sort of, uh, I, we started a Twitter account for the book. It's called at Babylon Reset. Uh -huh. uh, for Good. our next account at Babylon Reset, because you hit the nail on the head. We have the sort of five ideological and rhetorical instruments that are used uh, to dispossess us of our of of the civilization that has been passed down to us. And what those are is uh, victimism, Gnosticism, the anti-humanism, transhumanism, and the climate cult. Um, but yes, this this idea of the elite that have secret knowledge. And, and this secret knowledge gives them the right to control us, this Gnostic temptation. We saw the rise of Gnosticism in Germany, in post-World War I Germany, and the collapse of the Weimar Republic, 
and we saw what we got out of the rise of um, or the collapse of the Weimar Republic and this muck of this Gnostic muck. You know, we'll, we even see sort of Gnostic enthusiasms on the right, you know, on, on the left, you have sort of this Gnostic enthusiasm of BLM. And on the right, you have this Gnostic enthusiasm of QAnon, where people are taking their direction from anonymous, ambiguous, unrefutable, unverifiable uh, sources. And this is a great threat to our political community because Gnosticism leads to violence in the breakdown of, of charity and thoughtfulness to the other. Um, the other one is you talked about how it, it runs, the Great Reset runs counter to our founding. Again, I said this is an anthropological look at the Great Reset. And what do I really mean by that? Well, the United States is the only country in the history of the world founded on anthropology. Uh, the declaration principle that Abraham Lincoln said was the golden apple and the Constitution merely the frame for this work of art is that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed with their creator by their creator with inalienable rights i i think there was something our founding fathers missed it was not self-evident it is it was made evident through the revelation of sacred scripture indeed and, and after two thousand years of a civilization meditating on sacred scripture and on what does it mean for god to be made a man to be made in god's image uh, what does it mean for God to become man? What, what does all of this mean about the nature of the human person? Our republic was founded on this vision of the human person. The Great Reset uh, obviously despises this thought, uh, this nihilistic despair that's willing to drive the world into famine, into war, mm -hmm. um, that is, is um, utterly, um, you know, look at the consequences of the COVID uh, lockdown and the policy surrounding COVID created the greatest famine since since World War II, yet there were no mainstream news articles on this. David Beasley won the Nobel Prize um, in the wake of the famine for his work at the World Food Program to mitigate the famine, yet there were no stories on this. They were utterly insensitive to the suffering uh, that was caused to the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I hope to get people to understand that if we want to break the back of the Great Reset, it's going to be through solidarity with the vulnerable, those communities that have been placed outside of social concern that um, are being ground into dust um, uh, to serve the, the, the radical. They really are progressives. They are, Charles. They're radical progressives. Um, and it's progress for progress's sake, not for progress for the sake of humanity. You, you know, you look at the three million Uyghurs in concentration camps mm -hmm. uh, in, in CCP China. You look at um, the electric vehicle industry that's built on the back of African children digging mm -hmm. away for cobalt outside of the eyes of our cameras. And uh, yeah. not to mention the long term environmental problems associated with that. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's I mean, what is it, what's going to happen 10 years down the road when all of these batteries are dumped? somewhere i mean it's going to be a disaster you know it's worse than uh simple fossil fuels uh no if but, we had electric vehicles charles and someone invented the combustion engine it would be celebrated as an environmental <laughs> savior oh absolutely i mean it's crazy it's crazy i mean and it's all very much controlled and it's nothing to do with the uh, the best interests of humanity that we as individuals can i mean the whole principle of the founding was that we have freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of press. Not so that we can say the F word, I mean, which is what the way they portray it now, but so that we can have freedom of thought and we can assemble and develop thought and be free. And, uh, you know, you mentioned, I mean, just to go back, the idea of a man created in the image of God. We're created in the image. We're not God. We're images. We're imperfect. We'll never be perfected until, of course, the Messiah comes, maybe. But however that works, that's a, a religious question. But the point is that in today's world, we can have a, you know, we, we have to understand that no group of people that come along and claim to have perfect knowledge or enlightened knowledge are to be trusted. We, we have to trust ourselves. We have to pray, look within, you know, know truths as best we can in our imperfect life in this short lifetime not rely on these as you, these figures. I mean, you talk about Gnosticism. Isn't that what Gnosticism is? It's, it's kind of a, 
a, a more modern form of idol worship. You're worshiping this external entity that's created by man and manipulated by man, often at ill intent. And uh, we only worship God. I mean, only God, not man, not the state. That's the whole American ideal. Came from the Bible, as you say. I mean, the founding fathers were inspired by the Bible, also by the philosophy of John Locke, who talked about uh, the self-possessed person as sovereign and natural law. And that this movement of the Great Reset, which uh, really goes back, I mean, it's not new, tries to replace that natural law and that understanding of man under God, which of course is what the uh, Declaration says in the Creator, with the state. And they're getting away with it. People don't have any idea what's going on. Yeah, you, you know, you just hit, and it, so I have the five ideologies that are used as idols, as you say, they are idols, they are religions. Um, the main mm -hmm. religion of the age is victimism, banning concern for the vulnerable uh, to acquire power and wealth. But there's sort of five principles that I, I advocate that we will use to break the back of the Great Reset. The first is uh, returning to the understanding of the human person um, that has been granted to us through uh, 2000 years of meditating on what it means to be made in God's image. Um, Christian personalism. Number two is a trend, acknowledging a transcendent moral order or a law above public opinion, a law above the laws of man, um, as you call it, the natural law. I, in my book, I refer to it as a transcendent moral order. Then subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is is the majority of power uh, should remain in, in, in the person, in the community of family and friends. And the more distant you become from, from a person, the less the less role that distant uh, unelected bureaucracy should have in our life. What mm -hmm. the Great Reset seeks to do is turn that upside down. Your family and friends, if they're to have any influence on your life, it's to be to cancel you or to monitor you or to uh, condemn you in the service of the gods of the city and the service of that distant unelected bureau bureaucracy. Uh, again, through Gnosticism, which leads to the breakdown of the family and the breakdown of society. So subsidiarity, then solidarity. Solidarity is to serve those who are vulnerable um a radical at, 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 at a cost to oneself you know the difference between victimism and solidarity it's really easy to know is standing with this quote unquote dispossessed community or vulnerable community or person is it coming at a social cost for me or does are standing with this community bring me wealth power fame prestige well if it does that's probably you're exploiting a, a community or feigning concern for a community if it comes at a social cost uh, yeah, that's probably solidarity. And then finally is a humane economy. We should work to, uh, for a humane economy that is grounded in private property rights, set within thoughtfulness and concern for um, our posterity and the common good. And But I have an introduction, Charles, to young Americans. Uh, and in this introduction to young Americans, I give them a very simple path, not easy uh, in today's age, but a very simple path how to order their life to defeat the Great Reset. And it is simply to love God, to love your parents, to preserve your moral imagination from pornography and all the filth that swirls around us so that you can experience erotic love within marriage properly, have children, love and serve them, and order your life through your family in our community to serve our posterity. And this is what our ancestors did. Mm-hmm. And we live the beautiful life we did, Charles, because your grandparents and my grandparents and our great grandparents, they got on ships and they went far away and they worked horrible jobs and they suffered poverty and discrimination and disease and they lost children to childhood mortality and they had heartbreak and suffering and service. And they were thoughtful of us. You know, our founding fathers in almost every document and letter they wrote, they would say for us and our posterity, for us and our posterity. And it's like, since the baby boomers and, and, and subsequent generations, it's like we said, thank you for us. We got you. Thank you for <laughs> right. We, we forgot. Like, we're well, they're, they're, mo they're modern sophists, which is yeah. that they're living for today. They're not looking at the past. They're not looking at the future. I mean, Marx basically said that the past is irrelevant and that the present has to be rewritten. Um, and that. Uh, you know, we uh, hear a lot from liberals about democracy, democracy. The Founding Fathers rejected democracy because democracy 
is majority rule. Instead, they preferred protecting the right of the minority and the most vulnerable of all minorities, the individual. You yes. know, the uh, the person who is less able, you know, I mean, the, the people that often the left wraps around, right, runs them up the flag as if they stand for that. But, you know, a, a moral society, which America is based on, protects the, the basic rights of the minority, whether you like that person or not. You, you, you basically, when you do that, you're protecting your own rights of sovereignty when you protect someone else's. And uh, we seem to have surrendered that to this kind of majoritarian thing, this, this democracy, so-called, and, uh, and we've internationalized it, particularly since the Great World Wars, that uh, we were involved in, um, I think since, the, uh, since Wilson, we've been involved in perpetual wars all over the world that have had nothing to do with anything other than weakening people because wars weaken morality and they, they kill people. And, uh, you know, we haven't put the interests of our country first, which of course is why they well, Charles, hate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that because I run an organization that serves ethnic and religious minorities around the world facing ethnic cleansing and genocide. Yes. The past wars for the past 20 years have done nothing to advance our self-interest. Al Qaeda is bigger than ever. It operates freely in Afghanistan. Um, ISIS is back in Iraq. ISIS didn't exist until in the wake of our withdrawal from Iraq and our invasion and withdrawal from Iraq. Um, the Taliban is back in control of Afghanistan. Um, so you're right. And, and what we've done, like what we did in Afghanistan, we broke down and homogenized that society. And now there's no base of opposition to Islam, Islamist extremism in the country. Uh, the same thing in Iraq. We we broke down and liquidated. We saw the ethnic cleansing of the Chaldean and Assyrian Christians, of the Yazidis, uh, the suffering of the Kurds. Um, now we see the war between the Sunni and the Shia that's relentless. That we see the rise of ISIS, to which is a response in the Sunni community to address the uh, influence of Iran in Iraq. So it's, it's just quite it's quite catastrophic. And this is what we see. Our founding fathers, the two great points that you made. They were not saints. They knew that. They were men that were addled by tradition and history and culture and prejudice. And so they gave us a government that would handcuff us despite our imperfections and our prejudices. How wonderful that men who were addled with prejudice, yes, mm -hmm. men who were men of their time for good and for ill, um, because it was a great and, and beautiful and liberating age in the history of the human family, but they were still coming out of history and collision of cultures and all that is, is, is that, that goes along with that that our founding fathers gave us a republic that has allowed us for um going on three centuries now approaching three centuries that has allowed us to weather first the catholics then the italians the irish the jews now you know now we've got afghans and iraqis and we despite our prejudices we've knit together a beautiful and strong and prosperous political community and this was given to us from the children of puritans the grandchildren of puritan it's utterly unbelievable wonderful it is it's a miracle and the great reset wants to wash this all away like you said like mark said rewrite our history lie about our ancestors vilify them you know hold them all to the you know the opinions of if, if, if they didn't if the founding fathers you know you know, George Washington, in none of his letters, announced his pronouns. What a horrible man that guy was, George Washington. He never once told anyone his pronouns. Uh, they were not on his LinkedIn page. Uh, it's quite sourful. And that's it, Charles. It's, you said, we have to be, G.K. Chesterton, the witty British writer, said, yes. the generation that is thoughtless to its ancestors will be thoughtless to its posterity. Worse we hate our ancestors. We hate them. And, and we're we also being taught, we're being taught division. I mean, they're creating yeah. these false uh, separations. You know, we may not agree as individuals or as groups, but let's not fall for this kind of politics of division. And let's remember that we do have a couple of basic principles that we all support, if only for out of necessity, if only to maintain our peace but but probably for bigger reasons and that uh, you know this is part of an agenda i think very much part of the great reset to uh, deliberately sow these sorts of divisions 
and uh, it's kind of the uh, the old uh, British approach of how they maintain their empire, divide and conquer. You look at the recent battle that's erupted between Candace Owens and Ben Shapiro. Yeah, I don't know if you're following. That. I am following that. Yeah, it's quite sorrowful. And, and, and you nailed it. They're dividing the conservative movement the way the British divided the China, the Indians against the Indians, you know, and right. uh, in India. Um, and, and that's such a great point. And and I think part of it has been in this sort of to use the language of Rene Girard, this mimetic escalation. The left has been so vicious and brutal, weaponizing the Department of Justice and this and that and the cancel the rise of cancel culture with its cruelty and viciousness and lawfare that we as conservatives have seen every battle is almost an existential threat. We're fighting for our lives. And then we have distrust within our own ranks and division. And now we turn on each other and we fight with the same viciousness, which, which the left has waged against us. And we've returned the favor. And now we have this internal nice internecine warfare. And um, we've seen like the, the breakdown of civility and, 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 and maybe for good reason, you know, it's, uh, the conservatives were fighting by Marcus of Queensbury rules and, you know, the left were behaving as like, you know, 1980s movie ninjas. <laughs> and uh, yeah. we but but we need to remain humane and charitable and we need to keep the eye on the ball. And Twitter's changed us. X has changed us all. You know, I have an article coming out how the medium has changed the messenger, how social Good. media has made very thoughtful, humane people childish. Um, I don't even administer my own. I until recently didn't even have uh, a Twitter account. And now I refuse to manage it because I have a volatile personality. And I think I would be, be I would be I would quickly sink uh, uh, to the lowest common denominator. I would this water would would I would reach the level. So um, I think we have to be careful and we have to really mm. avoid uh, cruelty and division within the conservative movement. Yes. I mean, I like your observation about making us childish. I mean, I think that's part of an agenda. It goes back to the, the publishing of Playboy, right? Men are now boys, you know, and they're, they're, everything is whatever feels good. It's not, you know, stepping out and being a responsible man and a responsible woman. It's all kind of like um, kind of a diminution of our, of our individual sovereignty and our sense of morality and, and a kind of a blurring. And the ultimate example of that is the so-called trans movement, which I see as part of transhumanism, this idea that we're transitioning into some kind of a new man. It goes, it's a eugenic idea that they're going to transform us. Only God makes us who we are. You know, we, we, you know, we can't be transformed. It's not possible. It's bad science, I may add. Uh, so here we are at a time, I think, where we are at a precipice in terms of the Great Reset Really, it could go either way. Either they're going to become completely enthroned and they're going to utilize modern technologies that the Nazis and the communists couldn't have even imagined in terms of maintaining world control. Or we're going to become more awakened as a people around the world and we're going to throw off this yoke. I think that the election of Donald Trump was an example of that. That's why they despise Trump, because he may wake up the masses. <laughs> he may, you know, people are going to become aware of their own agency and reject these controls. So given that we are at that kind of breaking point, where do you think we're going, Jason? Do you think we have a chance at succeeding? And if so, how? Yeah, we home, we will succeed. I mean, inevitably against we will slay this dragon and there will be dragons behind it that are even uglier and more ominous that our posterity will have to face. Um, the question is how much suffering will have to happen first. Yes. And our job, I think, is to ameliorate the suffering, prevent the catastrophes from happening. Um, and, uh, you know, John Paul the Great wrote in his last book, Memory and Identity, a beautiful book, that when the Nazis rolled into Germany, his theology told him that this they wouldn't be there long mm. because evil is a deprivation and, and totalitarian, totalitarian regimes founded on ideologies of evil will collapse under their own weight. So we're seeing the Great Reset. Globalism is collapsing even before its ultimate success. We see it disintegrating around the world and really to the detriment of America's interests because liberalism, 
properly understood has morphed into neoliberalism, this disgusting, despicable authoritarian ideology. Mm -hmm. And and so as America became an authoritarian regime promulgating bizarre ideologies on traditional peoples from Africa across the Middle East and Central and South America, the Soviet, the Russians and the Chinese have weaponized, um, for example, our State Department's promulgating LGBT ideology. In fact, just today, um, Joe Biden ordered that no rainbow flags will be ever allowed to be floated in our embassies. Well, this is clearly a response to how effectively Russia and China has weaponized um, are you are pushing these weird ideologies on traditional people? Who right. Can, I mean, they're putting uh, they're putting yeah. our embassy people at risk. Yeah, they literally are, and it's insane. Charles, when I was in Iraq with the Peshmerga during their, their war against ISIS, mm -hmm. I interviewed a young woman who was sort of a representative of an ethnic minority facing genocide. I had asked her if she met with the State Department, and she said she had once, and that the per, the representative from the State Department said that they weren't focused on ethnic issues but lgbt issues so yeah. isis was yeah. not marauding across iraq looking for homosexuals they were marauding across iraq looking for christians and yazidi and you uh, know that seems to be the case with our entire military at a time when china is getting very tough i mean they're really those guys don't mess around they don't care which bathroom you use you know they're worried about you know weaponry and how to how to conduct themselves and no. it's just a, it's a recipe for disaster. It really is. No, my son is on my, my son in law is on a naval deployment right now overseas. And he said that there were a lot of navies involved in this um, in this uh, operation that they were partaking in. And they pulled into a port and all the other navies were shocked to see that there were women on the same ships as men. And they just thought it was confounding. And, uh, you know, I thought the rest of the world was moving in the same bizarre direction as us. So. Um, to know that even our allies don't have women on their ships. Um, yeah, we well, we've replaced our ba the basic function of, of putting the best skilled people in the best jobs to, uh, you know, the, the EBT scores or whatever the hell they call that. You know, the, well, um, uh, the, the um, GT score. G yeah, which, of course, comes right from communist China. And I think it has everything to do with placing people in various positions based on their skin color or based upon whatever, as opposed to the best person. And the result of that can be very, very dangerous when you're dealing with companies and how they run. Well, look at United. Look at yeah, United. Look at, look, at, look at Boeing. Boeing right? and United, they're collapsing. Yeah, they, they, you know, look. they're no longer worried about having the best engineers. I don't give a damn what, what the engineer looks like. No. I want to have the best engineer when I get on a freaking plane. You know, I yes. mean, it's like, it's really um, it completely to, irrational. Anesthesiologist picked based because of his, his ideology is correct. I don't Yeah, I mean, you're going to go under the knife for somebody? I, mean, I want to see what they've done in the world. I don't give a damn what the, what, whether or not their, their skin is, is black or white. You know, no, I mean. I, ideologies do kill. Yeah. You know, COVID policy caused famine. These ideologies kill. They're absurd. In New York City this week, they did not, they released back into the public four people who dismembered a body in Long Island. I saw that. And, you and know, they, this is, it's part of this whole business after COVID about, quote, reimagining crime in voice. Yeah, well, we had somebody that, like, with a butcher knife chopped the body up. Yeah. And they didn't, I guess it would be uh, authoritarian to make them pay bail. But I mean, I, yeah, I don't think that they were reimagining crime. I mean, no, they. Charles, <laughs> when I got arrested for leading an anti-lockdown protest in Hawaii, I had to pay bail. I just should have chopped somebody up. Oh I well, picked, of course, that was the ultimate I crime. The crime. I picked the wrong crime. I got to be more thoughtful in the crimes I choose to commit in the future. No, of but, course. I mean, they shut down the churches, but they left open the big box stores, screwing club. American business strip people. Club. No strip clubs. Strip clubs, Vegas. I remember Ted Cruz, I think, made the comment that, gee, we got a whole church at the casino. Well, you some know? pastor did. I think his name was Rob McCoy. I think it was Pastor Rob McCoy in San Diego. <laughs> I think he he put on a strip show, but he obviously he didn't strip. He just he he he, he right. got like tank top and his shorts, and he gave his his sermon. And that yeah, it's pretty funny. You know, there's something about that whole thing that really is everything to do with the Great Reset. The fact that in this country. 
and we could talk about this because I'm not running this on YouTube. Um, you know, we, the, uh, you could not use proven medicines to deal with viruses like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, which they now admit is fine. And people died because the drug companies, I think, were in collusion with government and they were pushing these uh, very dangerous remedies that are unproven. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's just a classic experiment in social engineering and totalitarianism. And it worked. I mean, it worked. Yeah. It didn't even take a major terrorist attack. It didn't take a real pandemic. No, people went all in. I mean, they were like walking around outside with masks on. I still see this. And there are still a few people in my neck of the woods here in Boston who are still wearing those masks. I mean, it's a, it's a cult. I was on a plane recently, and there were these two millennials, a boy and a girl, a couple. And the mm -hmm. girl, they both had on gas masks. And the, oh, they had on, the boy had on a Sex Pistols shirt, and his, no, a Violent Femme shirt. And his jeans were cut <laughs> from the top to the bottom and then baby pinned together, if you know what I mean. So, you know, I, I walked up to him and I said, young man, you're either punk rock or you're not. And if you're going to appropriate my generation's culture, you got to take off that mask. Now, you can wear the mask, but you better put on some orthopedic shoes and a turtleneck sweater and some khaki pants because you can't walk around wearing a Sex pistol shirt and a gas mask. You know, that's not punk rock, my friends. That's not punk rock. It's And this was like a couple months ago. Yeah. So this is this is where we are. And and but Charles, I want to make sure I get this point across. Yes. That we were created for just two simple things. Like we have the easiest mission statement. Like if you know, if we had a package that came with us at birth, uh, you know, and if we were in our mother and father would have opened it up, it would have said, This uh creature was made to love God and love his neighbor simple mission statement mm -hmm. and they throw these ideologies at us and whether it's communism fascism nazism whatever all the ideologies that are thrown at mankind uh over the centuries um and we're a part of this beautiful human family and for century after century we're dodging new struggles and new challenges and now we have ours it's this great reset it's globalism okay the key is Let's not let it take our eyes off the ball. Like we literally were just created to love God and love our neighbor. And to me, I was a hardcore Ayn Rand objectivist atheist into my late 20s. Right. But I went was, through an Ayn Rand period too. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, I hope your Ayn Rand period was like, you know, from, it's probably from the start of puberty to like, you yeah. got married. Something and, you like, know, she she missed the boat in terms of her hardcore atheism. I never quite got that because she had a lot to offer, except she kind of, there was certain big blind spots in terms I of... Can, uh, I can explain her atheism to you, Charles. So she, yeah. you know, she was a Russian Jew yep. who her family survived pogroms and she saw the rise of the Bolsheviks. And so anyone talking about love and benevolence, whether from a theological perspective or an ideological or political perspective, she assumed meant her harm. And I think she was really scandalized by religion and she was scandalized by ideology. And I'm not one of these former Randians who becomes a Christian and then likes to beat her up to show how wonderful I am. Right. I think she was a brave hero who, and, and, and of many like Russian and European Jews at the time, religion separated her from society. There was that division and yes. there was this desire just to fit in and belong and be left alone. And so I really see, of course, she's she promulgated radical individualism. But mm -hmm. she was in many ways a radical communitarian because and, she in some ways she actually embraced, I think, subconsciously some of the same, some of the Soviet elements that she uh, grew up with. I mean, she did go to college in the Soviet Union. Yeah. And the way she ran her Ayn Rand society. It was oh, yeah. Well, I think toward the end, I mean, they, frankly, with due respect, they kind of went off the deep end. Yeah, but, for sure. But when she got <laughs> right. Yeah. And it led me to believe in God. Ayn Rand, I wrote my conversion story several years ago for National Review. And it was how Roe v. Wade, Ayn Rand, and Jean-Paul Sartre led me to believe in God. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's good. But what Ayn Rand did for me is she just, she uh, she presented a vision of the human person in her fiction and nonfiction that 
uh, corresponded to what I saw that, you know, human beings have the self-evident dignity, but she called it self-evident, but it was Sartre and Freud and Nietzsche that helped me realize maybe it's not so self-evident. Maybe it's actually the fruit of Jewish and Christian scripture. And that this idea that it's self-evident is that we just take it for granted. And that's when I tried to like erect some atheist anthropology mm -hmm. and it can't. And, and that just led me to God. I, 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 you know, I say I found God in the mirror. And what Ayn Rand helped me see is this creature that he made in his image. It, your neighbor is the most beautiful thing in the cosmos. You could go on a spaceship in any direction for all of eternity, and you would never bump into a creature as interesting and as beautiful as your neighbor who leaves his trash can out five days after pickup, that guy who we don't like. But he's still the most beautiful creature in the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And so what the Great Reset wants to do is rob us of that vision. Divorce they, want us. To, they want to turn us into human resources very much like the platonic republic view of society that you know the greeks they would decide when the baby was born whether or not it would live or die and if they didn't deem it to be worthy of life they'd leave it on the hillside to die but if it was allowed to live they would decide at some point what profession they'd go in based upon what the state needed if they needed soldiers merchants farmers whatever and uh, that basically the function of life was to serve the will of the state um, you know, Ayn Rand actually was right about that. She talked about Plato versus Aristotle. But uh, the great uh, deist founding father, Thomas Jefferson, maybe in spite of himself, he noted that, uh, that we're endowed by the creator. As, you know, I mean, in a sense, that's what's self-evident. He says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that the creator endows us with rights, not the state. And... Uh, you know, that sort of has been the American philosophy, and I think it totally is derived from the scriptures, and I think that it's true, which is why it's enduring. So, Jason Jones, let my listeners and viewers know where they can get your book and a little bit about your organization and anything else you'd like to share. Thanks, Charles. Well, you know, it's, it's pre-sales available. It comes out April 16th. It's available at Amazon.com. Uh, we hit number one on Amazon a couple weeks ago for a few days. Yeah, uh, weeks fun. before coming out because um, Dr. Malone, um, the inventor of the technology used in the COVID vaccine. Yes, Robert Malone. Uh, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. who then came out against the vaccine, wrote just a glowing review. Fantastic. And published it as huge Substack. So it's pre-sales are going very well. Um, a great campaign at the great. Uh, I mean, uh, the great campaign against the Great Reset at Amazon.com. My organization. The Vulnerable People Project, our website is thegreatcampaign.org. And um, you can see our work there is to stand with the most vulnerable communities in the world when the world has abandoned them. So we we work and serve communities people don't know even exist. From We have security guards and cameras outside synagogues in Nigeria. We uh, have security guards and cameras outside girls' schools still open in Kabul. Uh, mm -hmm. We serve the persecuted church across the world. And to me, we're a Catholic organization. And I think that really as a Catholic man and through our organization, our mission is to stand with, we really look to serve those communities that no one has reached because it's really dangerous mm -hmm. um, and challenging to serve them. That's where we go. Um, we just opened mm -hmm. our newest office in Cebu in the Philippines with because of the rise of ISIS attacks on Catholic churches there. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to stand with the most vulnerable people in the world, um, which to me is the greatest way to live one's life, go to thegreatcampaign.org. I have my own podcast, The Jason Jones Show. This week, I'm doing a show every day, um, highlighting a different, it's the week of Good Friday. Good Friday, sadly, has traditionally been a time of really heightened religious persecution, persecution against mm -hmm. Christians and Christian acts of persecution. So what I want to do is take this week um, to highlight a different vulnerable community uh, around the world every day of this week. So that's the Jason Jones Show. Excellent. I mean, I think that I mean, I've talked over the years about what I would suggest is a genocide against Christians in the Arab countries and Muslim countries where Christians are indigenous 
to those countries. We just and, saw it, and, and we just saw in October, in Artsakh, the government of Azerbaijan, completely ethnically. Oh, I know, ethnically cleansed the Armenians, who had been there since the set that there had been masses there unbroken since the second century. Yes. That stopped in October, and there has not been a single word about that, and the, the press. Oh, yeah was quiet it, it doesn't fit the narrative you know but uh anyways uh jason listen thanks so much for joining me i really appreciate it great work god bless you and your work and we should do it again soon and thank you sir i'm here if you need me thanks thank charles you. all right take care